Hey guys, we're looking at round eight from the uh, FIDE uh, Chesscom uh, Grand um, Tour, uh, Grand Swiss rather. This game is between um, uh, Ali Reza Feruja, who is on fire right now, and uh, he's just showing some really, really incredible and entertaining chess games with the white pieces. And um, with the black pieces is Indian Grandmaster of uh, uh, Saskaron. And um, we're going to get right into it. I just analyzed the game from round seven from Feruja, where he uh, defeated uh, Evgeny Nair in a fantastic game uh, in the Petrov. So here we go. The game started out, as you can see, E4 from Feruja with the white pieces. Um, Krishna and Saskaron with the black pieces played e5, knight f3, knight c6. <clears throat> are we going to have a Rui Lopez? No, we are not. No Berlin walls, no martial attacks, anti marshals. We are going to <clears throat> the 1800s. Paul Morphy's favorite opening, Joko Piano. Okay. Bishop c5, are we going to see an Evans Gambit? No, we're not. We can't go that far. This too much theory, too much computer analysis for Evans Gambit uh, nowadays, at least at that level. Knight f6, right? But we do have main lines. D3, all right. Castles, castles. We've seen this many times before. Uh, Saskaron is a very aggressive player. He opts for uh, d5 here. Uh, which is very double-edged because if black is not careful, the e-pawn comes under tremendous uh, pressure in a lot of these uh, variations when you advance d5 uh, in the opening uh, like that, like that early. All right. But uh, what does uh, Saskaron get in compensation? He gets nice active uh, piece play and he gets some pressure on white's. Uh, D pawn and usually aggressive players like to play um, with uh, active and dynamic uh, pieces, right? Even if they have to uh, compromise a little bit statically uh, in their position, they want to have free pieces. E takes D5, Knight takes D5, Rook E1. So you can already see <clears throat> the pressure build up on the E file. Bishop G4, pieces coming out. Knight BD2. Now, knight uh, b6, attacking the bishop, of course. h3. If you looked at my last game that I analyzed from round 7, same similar situation where uh, Feruza questions the bishop. Right? What are you going to do? Are you going to trade? Are you going to stay on the c8, h3 diagonal? Are you going to go to h5? Right? These are very important um, uh, questions that the bishop needs to address because sometimes the bishop needs to stay on that c8 h3 diagonal for defensive purposes right sometimes to go to e6 right to prevent uh the bishop uh from um the bishop say on c4 for instance attacking down that diagonal on f7 all right bishop h5 was chose uh chosen just to show you there's some venom in this position let's say Knight takes c4, right? It's playable. Knight takes c4. Again, the pressure on the e-pawn. Bishop takes f3. Queen takes f3. Again, all about this pressure on the e-pawn. Say, let's say rook e8. Then black uh, will have to deal with white's uh, simple, straightforward plan of b4, b5. Hitting the bishop and the knight. And, of course, e5. Uh, would fall uh, quickly. Now the idea here is bishop d6. Bishop d6 adds more protection to the pawn on e5, but now the bishop uh, becomes passive, right? It was on a great great diagonal. Now it's it's passive. With a player like Saskiron and choosing this particular line with d5, right, it goes against the logic of his uh, planning to play a move like bishop uh, d6 there. But these highlights just illustrate some of the plans that white has. For instance, he can play uh, knight to e3, the idea of hopping into f5. 
can also play Bishop to e3 or Bishop d2 and also advance b4 and a4, b5 hitting the knight and again assailing uh, the pawn on e5. So white has some good options uh, in, the, uh, in these positions. Okay, back to the game. Bishop h5 and now Feruja makes a critical decision here. And he leaves the pawn on d3 on prees. He says, hey, just go ahead uh, and take it. Okay. Also possible with, you know, b4 here. It's like, let's say bishop e7 and then move like g4, for example. All right. So, Ruja said, hey, go ahead, take the pawn. Saskaran plays king h8 with this idea of playing f5. He's playing very aggressively. Interesting here is also in round seven, Nair played king h8, you know, albeit a different opening to Petro. He wound up playing king h8 um, when he really didn't need to, and I don't see the need here. Although in this particular position, um, Saskaran is following his, his plan, right? He's playing very aggressive. He wanted to get the uh, free piece play, and of course you can't allow white to build up on the e-pawn Things like that. So you have to use your dynamic um, potential uh, quickly. All right. However, if queen d3, he could just equalize. Bishop c2. Bishop takes f3. Knight takes f3, followed by queen d1, bishop d1, and rook a e8. Again, um, you know, with equality, at least in this variation that I have here. Or F6 is possible also. Saskiron, uh, Sasakiron comes to fight. He plays 90, um, King H8, though. So, 94 hitting the bishop. Knight D7. All right. And now Bishop D5. Again, the uh, attack on the E-pawn. And this is what you have to remember in this line is a, a lot of it has to deal with pressuring the e-pawn when black plays the early d5 in this. And you can see again, the idea here of white is to play knight takes a c5, which draws the knight on d7 away from the protection of the e-pawn, and then capture on uh, c6, which, du which double black's pawns, and then he can capture the e-pawn with the rook. Because remember... The bishop um, on h5 is uh, still pinning the knight on f3. However, the rook will be able to capture on e5. So that's uh, white's threat in that position. So Askeron just goes forward, plays f5. He doesn't care. <laughs> and knight eg5. This gives um, Feruja some counter-attacking uh, counter possibilities here. You can see the obvious uh, fork here. H6. So, Sesekiran uh, Sese is actually provoking uh, White into the move that he wants to play. You know what this means? It means that both grandmasters have seen the similar continuations and that so one, one of them is basically their butting heads. One of them is evaluated to position incorrect, incorrectly. So we're about to see uh, uh, who it is. So it's it's not an issue of uh, Sasakiran um, overlooking a fork. He sees it, but he's evaluating the position in his favor or, or viewing uh, this continuation at least as his, as, uh, his best chance in the game. And Feruja is... Also evaluating the position favorable to him. Other alternative to queen e7. But queen e7 is meant by d4. As you can see, the rook on e1 uh, prohibits black from capturing the d4 pawn with his bishop. Again, if queen f6, right, then the same thing. Knight comes to e6, hitting the rook and the pawn on c7. As highlighted, Rook FC8 trying to 
kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. But then Bishop G5. And you can see a lot of trouble for black. So black plays h6, knight e6, and queen f6. So black is playing extremely dynamic. He gives up the rook. After all, the files are closed, right? For the most part, right? You, set, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, D and E files are semi-open, but the rooks aren't really important uh, right now at this juncture uh, in the game due to the closed nature of the position. So knight takes, rook takes f8. So we can see black here fully developed. White is kind of behind in development a little bit. If you look as rook on a1, bishop on c1, all right? Um, the bishop on h5 is doing a good job against the knight, um, pinning him against the queen on uh, d1, right? So, Saskaron needs a few few moves here, all right? And he'll be, he will be, he'll be doing all right, okay? So, this is a critical point in the position for Feruza. He must find some way to uh, uh, counterattack or slow black down before black gains compensation for the exchange sacrifice. So d4, right? It blocks the action of the bishop. All right? So, let us imagine this This wasn't played, excuse me, this wasn't played in the game. Uh, e takes d4. What was played in the game uh, by uh, Saskaron was uh, e4. So let me just show you what happens um, on e takes d4. If e takes d4, that opens up the e file, as you can see. And now, remember what I was saying about the rooks not being as important because the files are closed? Now with the file opened, rook springs right into action. Right, rooks are made for open, open files. And so, let's say, for instance, after queen d8, this bishop takes c6, b takes c6, c takes d4, and eventually black is probably going to fall victim to a sacrifice on uh, h6, right? Well, you know, bishop takes h6 at some point. If bishop b6, bishop takes, b takes, again, knight takes e5. Remember how, how I keep repeating over and over. It's about the knight, about this uh, pawn on e5 that becomes under, that comes under great pressure when black plays early d5 in Gioco Piano. Now here, you're looking and saying, hey, what about the queen on d1? Well, black, white has excellent compensation for it. At the knight d7. Say queen f7, rook, uh, knight takes f8, bishop c2, knight comes out, and uh, bishop e4, and then uh, black, excuse me, white can just play knight f4. It's a great position. Now it gets to the game. So what um, Sasakiran played is e4, right? Driving the wedge in the position, drive, and, and the desire to also drive away Enemy pieces, he's pinning the knight, right? Rouge just takes, d takes e5, and now knight d e5. Piling on the pressure, okay? Because at this point, black has to win by by attack, all right? He has the, the better development, the, you know, leading development here, um, right? Advanced pawns on the king side. This is what Black has been um, uh, depending on. He's not going to be able to win the, the static game, right? He's not going to be able to win, you know, when things calm down, queens are traded off, etc., right? White has the two bishops, better pawn structure, and he's up in exchange. So if things calm down, Black is, you know, doesn't have anything. He has to win dynamically. He has to win. He has to take it by force right now. So he's going for it. Feruja shows his class here and plays a fantastic move here. Knight takes e5 again. Bishop takes d1. Knight d7. Queen d8. B 
Bishop takes c6. Rook e8. Rook d1. Bishop ta uh, b takes c6. Bishop f4. Queen h4. Bishop takes. And let me just say right here. Notice how white has taken all of the steam out of black's attack. Black had all of those active pieces, right? The, the knights, the bishop on h5, rook, the rook on uh, f8, queen. White took all the steam out of the, He got rid of all the pieces and developed his own pieces. Remember I was saying how white was behind in development? Now black, now white has all of his pieces developed. It saved the rook on a1. The attack is gone. There's no attack now. There's not enough pieces. Black doesn't have enough pieces. Now the only question is, does white have a compensation for the queen? Of course he does. He has two rooks for the queen, and he has uh, two minor pieces for the rook, which which gives white the upper hand, actually. Okay? And white is up an extra pawn. So again, black is determined. So Sasakiron continues to play for the tech. Like I said, this is the only way he can he can win. Not gonna win that end game or anything like that. He has to keep pressing. One thing I could play say about Sasakiron is that he stuck with his plan. It wasn't, you know, he he might have miscalculated here and there or overestimated his chances, but he stuck with his plan. You can see his plan clearly from beginning all the way through the game. So e3. F takes e3, rook takes e3, and now rook d4, queen e7, bishop f4, rook e2, b4, of course just protecting uh, the material, queen e8, rook f1, so everything is protected. Everything is in the game. So now white has secured himself, make sure make making sure the black can't, you know, checkmate him or or you know uh, check and win a piece or something like that. Everything's protected. Everything's well uh coordinated. Alright. So here um uh black attacks queen uh a two. So rook f two. Trade off trade off the rooks. Check. Bishop d2. Again, white's main concern is to limit the activity of black. All right, that the the, the static game is one. Right, the the static side, black white has all those advantages tucked away. So all he has to do is limit the dyna, dynamism of of black. Queen e6. Okay, all the pieces are protected. Really hard to find a check for black. So now, white will start advancing the queen side majority. C4. Bishop F4. Now queen E7. <clears throat> Excuse me. B5. A takes. C takes. You know, just simply creating a pass pawn. Queen E6. B6. Um, if he takes, then just C6. So, and you can see how the bishop on F4 supports the events to C7. This is why he just played Queen E6, but he allows B6. And he, his idea is to get behind the pawn before it can advance one more square. So Queen B3. He also has some type of checking opportunities. So not only does he temporarily stop uh, B5 from happening, but he also threatens, you know, the check. And hopefully he can create some confusion when a rook or something like that. You know, um, even in a perfect world, have some kind of perpetual check opportunities. But um, Ali Reza is not having it, okay? King G1, queen, uh, queen out, king out of there. And now G5. Is it like desperation, of course? But Sas uh, Sasakiron is going out on his shield, as they, they would say. He's going down fighting. Bishop d2 with a very simple plan to simply move the rook to b4, as I've highlighted, and then push the pawn. 
you could you could have played this king h7 here but again this takes more precise calculation as you kind of leaving your king exposed a little bit this plan is very simple and straightforward bishop d2 rook come up, comes over and push the pawn unstoppable g4 again attack into the end rook b4 there it is check what else king h2 there's some desperation g3 king takes g3 f4 you know hoping for you know something real silly uh king h2 and uh sasakiran resigned you know um there's no way to stop the uh pawn uh pawn from uh queening right after you know queen takes uh d2 for instance you could just simply uh push push the pawn right there's no way to to stop the diabolical plan of ali reza uh <laughs> just kidding anyway that is the end of this video um, I just did the analysis, like I said, around this round seven game between uh, Faruja and Nair. So I'm pretty tired. So uh, I just want, but this game was a um, spectacular game. I love the run that uh, uh, Ali Reza is on. So that gave me enough hype and energy to want to make this video for you guys out there. Please hit the thumbs up button. Please subscribe to my channel and also check the links below. I always put videos and DVDs uh, there uh, pertaining to whatever opening that, uh, you know, was on the board today. So here, Gioco Piano. So check below for books, DVDs, and consider supporting uh, my channel. All right. So please get in that comment section. Let me know what you guys think of this game and um, Ali Razor's run. That he's on uh, in this particular tournament. And um, I'll see you guys on the next video.